Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rebecca Hersman. I am the director of the Project of Nuclear Issues here at CSIS. And I am pleased and uh, very happy to welcome you to today's conference, The Nuclear Policy Trilemma, Balancing Nuclear Modernization, Alliance Management, and Effective Arms Control in a Competitive Security Environment. We're thrilled so many of you could be joining us today uh, for what I know will be an interesting discussion both today and tomorrow. This conference was premised on the idea that even as the United States government today seeks to advance all three of the objectives reflected in the conference title, doing so inevitably involves tensions and trade-offs, sometimes quite difficult ones as we navigate this sometimes complex terrain. News of the AUKUS agreement just over the last week is a powerful example of some of the tensions that exist between alliance management, non-proliferation, and managing a highly competitive security environment. As the administration moves forward with the nuclear posture review embedded in a national defense strategy that emphasizes integrated deterrence, we can expect more of these tensions to play out publicly and privately. Over the next two days, We'll hear from experts in the field on issues such as Alliance views on US nuclear weapons policy, challenges and opportunities for US nuclear modernization and key capabilities needed to maintain a credible US deterrent. Throughout this process, Congress will have a critical role to play in arbitrating these sometimes conflicting priorities and the NDAA will be a vehicle by which Congress lays down some early markers on these issues. For this reason, I'm thrilled that Senator Angus King will be joining us this morning to discuss these topics. Before I turn to that, I have just a couple of quick housekeeping comments to address. First, uh, this conference is on the record um, and a recording of today and tomorrow's events will be available on the CSIS event page a few days following. You'll receive notices when that is available. And secondly, I would like just to take a minute to thank um, our primary sponsor for this event, Northrop Grumman, for their support in convening in such an important uh, conference on such interesting topics. So we thank them for providing that support. But before we do anything else, I now would like to turn to welcoming Senator Angus King, uh, a fellow Mainer, I might add, to offer our keynote uh, discussion. Um, Senator Angus King was sworn in as Maine's first independent United States Senator in 2013. Um, I would say actually a longstanding tradition of independence in Maine politics. Senator King is a member of the uh, Armed Services Committee, the Select Committee on Intelligence, Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, and the Committee on Rules and Administration. In his time in the Senate, Senator King has worked to strengthen America's national security, conducted critical oversight of the nation's intelligence community, and has supported common sense budget priorities. He is a leading voice on the importance of improving the United States cybersecurity. And Senator King was selected by the congressional leadership to co chair the Cyberspace Solarium Commission a bipartisan effort established by Congress to review the threats facing America in cyberspace and to develop a forward-leaning plan on how to defend ourselves against cyber threats. Prior to taking office, Senator King served two terms as the 72nd governor of Maine from 1995 to 2003. Sir, we're thrilled to have you with us here today and to hear some of your thoughts on these topics. And so with that, I would like to turn the floor uh, virtual as it is over to you. Well, thanks very much. I didn't know about the main connection, uh, Rebecca. That's uh, that's an added bonus. No wonder I signed up to, to do this. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, I'm the chair of two subcommittees in the Senate, uh, and I think it takes the record for the diversity of subject matter. One is strategic forces on armed services, which is, as you know, a euphemism for nuclear weapons. And the other is national parks on energy and natural resources committee. So I think 
national parks and nuclear weapons as a pretty broad uh, spectrum of uh, responsibilities. Uh, I wrote my uh, college senior thesis in 1966 on uh, the theory of deterrence and uh, the Cold War. Uh, Admiral Richards, the head of STRATCOM, when he heard that, uh, has set naval intelligence on trying to find that document. So far, he hasn't been able to. But uh, I remember thinking, and this was you know, early on in the, the thinking about uh, deterrence and mutually assured destruction and the whole idea of, of, of the, uh, the, the sort of standoff that was the basis of the, of the Cold War that you know, went from the 50s to the 90s. So, um, however, that was the last time I really had to think about these issues in a hard way. And as you mentioned, I've been governor of Maine, which uh, doesn't really involve much in the way of foreign policy, although we can see Canada for Maine. So there is that. Uh, but I came to the Senate and was assigned to armed services and intelligence, which means that uh, a good 60, 70 percent of my time is spent on on foreign policy. And then when I was appointed uh, this, uh, this winter to be chair of strategic forces, uh, that caused me to really dig into a lot of these uh, issues. So I come at this to, in some ways with fresh eyes. It's not something that I've been working on my whole life uh, and I haven't been engaged in, in this issue. So I've tried to uh, really think about uh, some of the issues involved that we'll talk about today and to come at them uh, without uh, terrible, uh, you know, without a lot of uh, preconceptions. I've talked to Bill Perry, read his book, The Button, talked to people about the modernization. Uh, we had a series of very substantive hearings at the subcommittee this winter uh, on uh, the various issues. And, and I insisted that we invite people from uh, varying points of view. They were uh, some pretty contentious hearings, but they were illuminating and, and I think important. So, uh, let me talk about where we are. We're in a fundamentally different place right now than, than for the past 40 or 50 years. Uh, the, the, the Cold War was characterized as a, as a bipolar world. We had the Soviet Union and, and the United States, and that was it. And that was the, that was the relationship, that was the, the structure of deterrence, the structure of the nuclear uh, arrangements as between the two countries, leading ultimately to uh, various treaties, as you know. Now, China is very much in the mix. Uh, it's now a tripolar world, and, it's, and China is, is deeply engaged in a nuclear buildup. Admiral Richards characterized it as breathtaking, what they're doing uh, in terms of the, of the building of not only uh, nuclear weapons, but uh, the deployment of nuclear weapons, submarines, land-based missiles, bombers. They're, uh, they're rapidly expanding their nuclear capability, which complicates the whole calculus. Uh, uh, it, it's much simpler when you're, when you're dealing with two countries. Now you're dealing with three, and uh, they're different countries. They're, they're, they have different histories, different cultures. And so the rules of the game that were played with regard to the Soviet Union and then Russia uh, don't really necessarily apply to China. And I will... Uh, I'll uh, digress just a moment to recommend to everyone uh, in, the, in the virtual room today, uh, uh, the book uh, Destined for War by Graham Allison. Uh, if you haven't read it, I, I think it should be required reading for anyone interested in foreign policy in 2021. It's the best analysis I've seen, not only of, of his, history, which of course Graham is a master of, but also the culture and history of China Xi Jinping, what kind of person he is, where he came from, what his background is. And I'm firmly of the belief that one of the problems with American foreign policy historically has been a lack of understanding and appreciation of others' cultures and history. Um, we think everybody thinks like us. And uh, we've learned uh, to our regret in a number of different situations that that just isn't the case and understanding what China wants. That's my most common question in hearings. What does China want? Uh, I think is, is critical to dealing with this new, new world of uh, nuclear competition. Um, 
deterrence is still our basic strategy. Uh, we build uh, destroyers at, at Bath Ironworks in Maine, and I speak pretty much at every christening of a new ship. And I always say some variation of the same thing, which is we're building this ship so that it will never be used. The whole idea of deterrence is to have the capability uh, to uh, respond to a, any kind of attack or aggression against this country in order to deter that aggression. The best attack is the one that doesn't happen. And so deterrence has always been the, the mainstay, the fundamental mainstay of America's strategy, and particularly nuclear deterrence. That was the, that was the heart of the strategy uh, during the Cold War. Uh, and that brings us to modernization. Deterrence really, if you think about it, is rests upon two, two basic principles. One is capability and the other is will. Capability is, do you have the ability to inflict damage, to impose costs on your adversary? Will is what it sounds like. Do you have the will to use that capability? Should it be necessary? The problem that we have right now, and, and by the way, the, the whole uh, deterrence is a, is a study in psychology. Its, its whole intent is to affect the mental processes of your adversary, to affect their calculus uh, in terms of whether or not to uh, uh, initiate some kind of aggression against this country. So the question is, if the, if the capability deteriorates, and in this world, everybody knows the, the pretty much the, the, the parameters of the capability of, of each other, if the capability deteriorates, that means deterrence deteriorates. That means deterrence is no longer uh, uh, as, as powerful a, a, a shielded buckler, and uh, you end up with a, a dangerous, a more dangerous situation that could lead to an adversary miscalculating or frankly calculating and saying uh, they can't strike us the way they could and therefore uh, there is some advantage to be gained. Uh, and that, that that's, as I said, brings us to modernization. The problem we have financially or fiscally in this country is that all three legs of the nuclear triad have aged uh, similarly and uh, the modernization bill is coming due uh, for all three at the same time. The B, a new B-21 bomber, Columbia class uh, nuclear uh, submarines, and a new ground-based strategic deterrent of missile, uh, new missiles, uh, all because the existing fleet of uh, deterrent vehicles are aging out. Uh, the current group of, uh, of uh, nuclear submarines of, of uh, uh, SSBNs are, are now reaching or will, will be within the next 10 years reaching the end of their, their lives. Uh, the bomber fleet is aging uh, and uh, the missiles uh, are clearly, the, the Minuteman 3 are clearly uh, reaching a, a, uh, a point of, of diminished capacity. Uh, with regard to the bombers and the missile fleet, I went out, we went and looked, put, brought a group from the Strategic Forces Subcommittee to mine at North Dakota uh, earlier this year, uh, where we could look at two legs of the triad at once. We, the, the bomber, there, there are bombers there, uh, but there was also a, a large uh, Minuteman uh, installation uh, scattered across the plains of North Dakota. By the way, North Dakota is the flattest place I've ever been. Being from Maine, I'm not used to uh, the geography where if you're six feet tall and you walk out on the street, you're the highest thing within miles. They, they say the good thing out there, the good news is if your dog runs away, you can still see him for three days. And uh, <laughs> I believe that. Uh, but we, we visited the, the Minuteman field. We climbed down in a, in a silo. Uh, and saw how difficult it is to maintain these, uh, these missiles. And uh, there's just, to, to me, that, that was one of the things that convinced me that they, that they needed modernization. Um, and of course, the lead time on some of these things like a new missile or a new submarine is, is substantial. So if you wait until it's a drastic need, then it, it's too late almost by definition and you have a, 
a, a capability gap that again undermines the whole uh, concept of deterrence. So um, the other the other piece that convinced me, and this was one of the issues that I really hadn't decided uh, when I began my work on this subcommittee, was uh, do we really need the ground-based uh, missiles? And and there's a lot of discussion about that, as you know, and I'm sure there are people in this audience that that believe that 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 can be dispensed with. What convinced me, and I'm just being totally honest with, with you all, what convinced me that that was a flawed strategy is that it really depends upon the theory of invulnerability of our submarines. Uh, the, the argument goes, well, we've got the bomber fleet and we have these uh, silent, uh, invulnerable uh, SSBNs that can patrol the world. They're a sufficient deterrent. We don't need the missiles uh, and, and we can rely on those submarines. The nagging fear that I have and had is, yes, the, the submarines are essentially undetectable now, but I don't know how any of us can have confidence that that will continue to be the case five, 10, 15 years from now. We don't know what's gonna be developed in terms of technology from space, perhaps, you can they, someone will develop a technology that can detect disturbances in the, in the undersea uh, water column uh, that would indicate the presence of a submarine. I can assure you that everyone in the world is working on submarine detection technology. So the idea that we could dispense with the missile uh, capability while we rely upon the invulnerability of the submarines to me was a dangerous bet. And it strikes me that, that the uh, that the uh, restoration or the uh, renovation of the ground-based deterrent, uh, strategic deterrent, is, uh, makes sense. Now, let's talk about cost. The problem is, as I mentioned, we're doing all three at once, and it's very expensive. Uh, it, I, I characterized it the other day as, as the, you, you put these three programs together, it's the, it's the pig and the python of the defense budget. Uh, it's a big bulge that's in the defense budget starting a year or two ago or three or four years ago, actually, and moving through the next decade. It's, it is a major expenditure. There's no doubt about it. On the other hand, it still is in, I, I, haven't, I didn't check the figures this morning, but as I recall, it's in, it still means that the, the nuclear enterprise is in the single digits in terms of the percentage of the overall defense budget. So it's expensive, but I think it was Jim Mattis that said, uh, we can afford to be safe. Uh, and I think this is such an important area, particularly with the Chinese buildup, uh, that we, we can't afford not to do uh, th these, uh, these projects. Uh, I just, I, I think that's a, it's just essential. And as I said, the problem with something like the ground-based deterrent is replacing those missiles is going to be a, a, a five to ten year uh, proposition, uh, and so if, as I say, if you wait till it's really too late, then you've 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 missed, uh, you, you've lost a, a lot of time. The other problem with the financial aspect of this is, uh, and this is this sort of surprises me as a private sector former businessman, the United States government has no capital budget. The budget is all expenses. In other words, a, a park ranger's salary is the same as the cost of a 40-year nuclear submarine. Uh, and so you, you, get a, you get this sort of skewed uh, view of the budget where capital items uh, count the same as, as a regular ongoing expenses. And I think that uh, is a, I think it's a mistake generally of how we budget. I think we'd have a much clearer picture of how we're budgeting if we uh, separated capital from uh, operating. But, but uh, for some reason, I'm not in charge of how the, how the budget is, is run around here. Uh, so it is, the, it is what it is. But in reality, most of these systems, all of these systems are capital. They're going to be there for uh, dozens of years, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And uh, I think they should be looked at as such in terms, uh, in terms of the, in the, uh, in, in terms of their long-term cost. Uh, 
I think uh, I think what I what I want to talk about for a minute is uh, arms control and and really conclude on that. Uh, we developed a relationship with the Russians over the years, over the late later stages of the Cold War, uh, that involved some perception of the mutual interest that we both had in arms control and particularly in in uh, in nuclear uh, uh, arms control. The Chinese seem uninterested in this process. Uh, my understanding is that they didn't even want to sit in on the recent discussions with the with the Russians on the renewal of the New START Treaty. Uh, they're very reluctant to engage in a hotline. They're very reluctant to engage in any talks. And I don't really know why, except perhaps they feel that they're, they would be disadvantaged until they reach a point of some parity with Russia and the United States on these matters. Uh, and therefore, they're just not going to engage at, at that, uh, until that time comes. Uh, that makes a dangerous situation. Uh, obviously, I think the world is a safer place if we have agreements on nuclear weapons, uh, if we have limitations. Uh, but right now, China is just, as I say, seems totally uninterested in that, in that proposition. So uh, we've got to continue to discuss with the Russians uh, and hopefully eventually uh, engage with the Chinese on, on those issues. But but now that doesn't seem to be the case. The final issue that keeps me up at night is proliferation. And uh, as you all know, there are seven or eight or nine nuclear countries and have been for some time. But the danger to me, the gravest danger is nuclear technology falling into the hands of a group of terrorists. And given the number of countries that have this technology, some of which are more responsible than others, or that's a polite way of saying some of which are not as responsible as others, to me is the gravest danger facing humanity. The terrorists on September 11th killed 3,000 people. If they'd had the capability, they would have killed 3 million. They, weren't, they wouldn't distinguish. And... The only thing that kept them from that capability is the lack of, avail of, of access to nuclear technology. So my nightmare, and, and, and by the way, going back to the beginning and deterrence, if you think about it, deterrence doesn't work with a terrorist organization. The whole theory of deterrence is you bomb us and we'll bomb you and your country will be destroyed and you'll be out of power and uh, you know, it's gonna be a catastrophe on both sides. A terrorist organization is made up of many people who don't care about being killed, who don't have a government, who don't have cities. Uh, they have very little at risk. And so we really haven't figured out how to apply the theory of deterrence or some new theory to defend ourselves against nuclear terrorism. And uh, I hate to be pessimistic, but given some of the countries that have this technology, and given the uh, intent of some of these terrorist organizations to do us harm, I don't think it's far-fetched uh, to see, think of a tramp steamer uh, heading into Miami Harbor uh, with a, a, a thermonuclear device in the hold. Um, the only thing I can think of that the best defense against that is intelligence. We have to know what's happening around the world and keep track of, of, of the plotting that's going on among these groups. But that is, a, I think, a grave concern, uh, not necessarily on the front burner today, but I think we have, all of us who are engaged in these kind of strategic thoughts uh, have to be thinking about that aspect of this, of this issue. Uh, so those are some of the, the, the thoughts that I have. Uh, I think we'll uh, certainly continue to uh, to work on the issue. I look forward to working with many of, of, of it, those in the audience. Uh, and, and I will say that in my experience here in, in Congress, ideas are the most valuable commodity. And uh, as we do, I don't think we've ever had a more important nuclear posture review. And as we go through the upcoming nuclear posture review, it's going to be unlike any that went before it. Uh, because we're in the in the world of, of both China and the, and the Soviet and, and I'm sorry and Russia, 
but also because we're in a world of potential uh, proliferation that is uh, uh, profoundly dangerous. So I'll stop there. And uh, uh, Rebecca, I think we have some questions. I'm delighted to have a chance to, to chat with you. Well, thank you so much, Senator King. Um, you've put a lot on the table. Uh, to the audience, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a couple of follow-up questions and give you a few minutes to post uh, some questions in the Q&A function. So please be sure to use that um, and uh, submit them there. And I'll turn to those in, in just a couple of minutes. Let me maybe uh, pick up first with where you left off, um, the nuclear posture review. Um, I'm wondering, this is sort of an opportunity, you know, are there certain things you really want to make sure get addressed or that you have any sort of concerns in the way the, the posture review will be set up. There'll be, you know, we expect a review that is more embedded into uh, the national defense strategy. Um, I think there's still a bit of sorting out in terms of both the process and the, and the timing and the details, but there's a lot of issues on, on their plate, um, whether it's from declaratory policy to uh, some of the additional um, capabilities, uh, nuclear capabilities that were put forward uh, during the Trump administration and, and a variety of other issues. So if you had sort of a top three, you know, list for the NPR of, you know, I'm really hoping, you know, you're working on these, what, what would you do with that? What would, what would be your, your message there? Well, I, I think number one is, is what do we do with China? I mean, that's gotta be, I think that's the, the highest priority in terms of the review. Uh, we need a very clear-eyed picture of what China's doing, and I think we we have that to some extent, but that's going to depend on, on intelligence. But I but I think number one is is China. Number two, it strikes me is what is the potential for some kind of alliance between China and Russia? Uh, there are cases around the world where they are they are appearing to find some common cause, uh, and and to to what extent is that a uh, going to be an issue. And it, it, ironically, it, it almost goes back to my, my college thesis. Uh, China and Russia, or, or China and the Soviet Union, were viewed as the communist bloc uh, for the early part of the Cold War. And then I remember the term the Sino Soviet split. And uh, they sort of went their separate ways. And the question is whether they will return to some kind of alliance against the West. Uh, and, and I don't know the answer to that, but I think that has to be examined. And then finally, I, I hope some attention is paid to the question of proliferation uh, and particularly terrorist groups and the fact that conventional deterrent policy doesn't apply. And what, so, so what does? Uh, the, the deterrence has defended us, uh, has successfully prohibit, uh, prevented nuclear war for uh, 80 years, let's see, 60, yeah, 80 years. Uh, and yet we're dealing with an entirely different situation where the theory of deterrence doesn't work. So I would like to see somebody working on, you know, what's deterrence 2.0 look like with regard to non-state actors. So those are the three things I, I hope will be touched upon in the, in the review. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's interesting because we do seem to swing a bit, um, you know, back in the 2009, 2010, I think um, proliferation and concern about nuclear terrorism was pretty high on the agenda and addressed in, in the Obama um, nuclear posture review. And then we've kind of moved back to a more kind of great power challenge in China. I guess we have to really figure out how to do both at the same time, rather than seeming to choose between one or the other. Um, I guess the question is, do you, do you think we can do that? Or do you think that there is a sort of a tension between these two uh, nuclear priorities, or is there a way to kind of bring them together in a more holistic uh, approach? Well, you, you said, do I think we can do it? I think we have to do it. I, I don't think it's, there's a choice. I mean, the, China is, uh, is arming to the teeth uh, and drastically expanding their submarine fleet, uh, deploying uh, missiles, deploying mobile missiles, which are an, an additional uh, strategic challenge. Um, so I, I think, you know, uh, there's got to be, uh, in terms of China, there's got to be a, some very good analysis and there, and we have a lot of it about exactly what it is that, that, that they're doing. Uh, and, oh, and by the way, one thing I didn't mention, when we talk about the triad, 
and we talk about modernizing the triad, I really think we ought to use the term the quad because I think nuclear command and control is as important as any leg of the triad. We can have the best weapons in the world, but if the president can't launch them, or if, if, we, if, if there isn't communication uh, between the, the, uh, the Defense Department and the president and the, and the, the uh, pieces of the triad, then it, it, it doesn't work. If, if they can compromise, if an adversary can compromise our command and control, they've, they've uh, essentially canceled our nuclear deterrent. So uh, modernizing uh, NC3 and particularly cyber protection is absolutely to me a, a, a critical uh, part of the modernization. Any conflict that is coming our way will start with a major cyber attack, the purpose of which will be to blind, uh, blind us and uh, cut off our communications. And um, so I, I, I can't emphasize enough that command and control has got to be an essential part of the modernization process. And I think it is. Uh, when we went out to mine it, we then went down to Omaha to Stratcom and spent a morning with uh, Admiral Richard and his folks. And they're, they're very focused on the, on the issue of command and control. But, but I just I, I think it should, we, we got to keep hammering on that because it's not as sexy as new missiles or uh, new, new bombers. Right. Well, and I was very taken with your, you know, uh, description of visiting at Minot and going down uh, into one of the capsules. Uh, I led a pony group pre-COVID and we did the same thing. And it was a sobering experience to actually be down there and see the maintenance challenges. Uh, I know it affected my thinking at yeah. the time. Um, and I think of most of the people who went with us. And maybe that is playing out a bit in the NDAA because you laid out the budget challenge very well. And, and, but on the other hand, the bills look like um, support is pretty strong for modernization. Are there any big areas of discrepancy? Are there any big concerns? Uh, well, what do you see as, as, as sort of under debate um, in the NDAA process on these issues? Well, we haven't, we haven't come to the floor yet with the bill and there's still, uh, there's still some work to be done to, to finalize the bill as it comes to the floor. But by and large, there, there was not a lot of debate on this subject and I expected there to be, but uh, uh, most people as they get, gain a better understanding of the, of the situation, uh, like me, I mean, I, I started out pretty much agnostic uh, on this last December uh, and really got to the place where I think the uh, modernization of the, of the missile uh, system is, is necessary uh, mm -hmm. for reasons that I articulated. So uh, there may be differences. There'll be some differences for, with the House. I think the House uh, was a little more reluctant, talked about getting reports and things like that. Uh, those will be re resolved in, in conference. But there doesn't seem to be a strong, full-throated debate about what we need to do. Right, right, interesting. Um, well, you know, I'm gonna take a quick break to let people know I'm gonna to turn to you after just one more question. Um, there is a number of uh, interesting comments and things that I would was hoping people would raise coming up in the, in the chat and uh, Q&A function. So I'll turn that. I just have one final question for you, sir. Um, you know, you'd mentioned the importance of arms control and the challenges in bringing uh, China to the table, which are indeed, you know, kind of big obstacles in, in the way forward. But we have some pretty big domestic obstacles when it comes to arms control as well, especially in terms of securing um, the advice and consent of the Senate if we go down a, a treaty road in the future. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think there's a process in the same way that Kind of people have come along in terms of in on the hill at looking at modernization they might similarly do so on arms control or perhaps being able to support formal agreements um or well, that, is it not possible that's a really good question we seem to have in the senate what i call the anti-treaty caucus which people people just won't support any kind of treaty uh which somehow this has become a politically popular position of, you know, I'm not supporting any treaties, they abrogate US sovereignty. I mean, the classic example is the law of the sea. Talk about shooting yourselves in the foot. I mean, we're standing on the sidelines where major disputes around the world are being resolved through the, the, the uh, UNCLOS 
and we're not in the game and it's costing us and it's hurting us. And yet, you know, every, every expert, every military person, every thoughtful public, uh, you know, public policy, international relations person I've asked, I've, I've asked that question probably 25 times in the last nine years. Every single time the answer is yes, of course we should ratify law of the sea. We can't do it. Uh, there's this wrongheaded uh, view that any compromise of sovereignty, can't, we can't do that. We can't, uh, uh, we can't do treaties, but that's, it, it's ridiculous. We all compromise our sovereignty every day in order to make us safer. We drive on the right. That, that compromises your sovereignty to drive on the left or your sovereign right to drive through an intersection without stopping at a red light. Why do you do it? Because it makes you safer and it makes you less likely to be killed and less likely to kill other people. So we, we by, by agreeing uh, to these uh, conventions, whether it's in nuclear arms control or law of the sea or, or whatever it is, we increase our international uh, uh, safety and, and national security. So, but, but I can tell you, I mean, there are people here who just are never gonna vote for a treaty. And whether we can get 67 votes uh, for any treaty, no matter how strong it is, I, I, I question. I think this is a, I haven't been here, I, I've been here almost nine years, but I think there's been a sea change in the, in the attitude around here. I don't know if we could get start through again uh, if we were, had to do it today. So I hope we can get through to some of these folks that they're, they are really compromising national security uh, by being unwilling to even consider uh, a treaty with sufficient safeguards that doesn't compromise national sovereignty, but indeed enhances national security. I didn't mean to make a, give you a lecture on that, but it's, it's something that really bothers me. The, the law of the sea, just, I, I just, that, like I say, that's a self-inflicted wound. Yes, uh, absolutely. Well, yeah, appreciate your comments on that, actually. Uh, let me turn now to some of the questions that are coming in from the audience. We've got a number of good ones. I'm gonna start with one from Elaine Bunn, because uh, she really brings up one of the other topics of the, of the conference and the panel that will follow you. Um, what do you see as priorities in this area for working with allies, especially regarding extended nuclear deterrence? Do you see any you know, kind of tensions? Do you have any, any concerns there? Um, and how strongly do you think we should continue to emphasize extended deterrence as well as the central deterrence? I, I, think, it, I think it's really important because the alternative to extended deterrence is proliferation. Mm -hmm. uh, if the Japanese decide that we're not gonna uh, provide our nuclear umbrella, they're gonna, they're gonna develop a capacity or the South Koreans, uh, or other countries around the world. I, I, I think uh, extended deterrence is a, is a very important concept. It's, it's difficult. It's a, it's a difficult intellectual one because you're, you're putting at risk your country on behalf of another country. But uh, the alternative to me is, more, is a more dangerous uh, international scene. So I, I believe that uh, the, the idea of the American nuclear umbrella is is, is very important to, to both uh, international stability uh, in terms of, of some limitation on regional conflict, uh, but also in terms of proliferation. Thank you. Um, you know, you emphasized in your remarks the importance of, of kind of addressing the concerns from China. There's at least two questions here regarding um, the recent uh, agreement announced on AUKUS the Australia, uh, UK, US uh, nuclear naval propulsion uh, proposal that is, has kind of caught the uh, foreign policy world by storm over the last week. Um, so Dan Leone has asked for your view on that partnership and the naval propulsion piece. Uh, a couple of others have asked uh, as well, relatedly about, do you think this type of approach, this type of alliance effort is the right way to go about kind of countering or checking some of China's ambitions? So two questions, but in a very similar topic area, if you don't mind. Well, before I answer that, let me, let me mention something about China and the Pacific that I think is important. We're talking mostly here this morning about nuclear weapons. Uh, to me, one of the most serious strategic uh, gaps, if you will, for the U.S. is our uh, questionable ability to counter hypersonic weapons. Mm -hmm. 
Our principal strategy in the Pacific is one of, of force projection based largely upon carriers. And if a carrier can be taken out by a hypersonic missile uh, from China that's right now largely undefensible, uh, that renders our strategy uh, very vulnerable. Uh, and, and that worries me. I, if, if there is a strategic problem that the U.S. faces, I believe it's, uh, uh, it's both in the offensive, but particularly in the defensive area of dealing with hypersonic weapons. Um, if we can't defend against them, then we have to develop them themselves so that we can develop a deterrence on the use of, of hypersonic weapons. But uh, I, 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 I wanted to mention that before we get uh, too much further into the discussion. I don't know much more about what's going on with France, Australia, and the U.S. other than what's been on the press. I, on the way in this morning, I listened to the French ambassador uh, uh, very unhappy about what went on. You know, I, I don't know what should have been done in that situation. It seems to me that the Australians who were the ones that were going to breach this agreement should have been the ones to tell France, look, you should know we're in discussions with the Americans because we think we need a nuclear capability and what we originally proposed for you to build for us just isn't gonna, uh, isn't gonna serve our needs. Uh, they didn't do that. Of course, we had meetings with French counterparts and didn't mention it either. Um, so clearly there's some fence mending uh, to be done. I don't suspect it will be a uh, long-term breach in the, in the relationship between the U.S. and France or the U.S. and the EU. But clearly it, was, it, it probably could have been handled better in terms of, of communication. Although whenever the French were told, they would have been mad as hell. Um, when, you know, if it would have been two months ago or a year ago or, or last week, uh, it, that, that's, but I, I don't know the details of why the Australians made this decision, but I suspect they're going to have to pay some penalties and, and to, to France and, and, but they obviously made a decision that this was in their uh, national security interest. Thank you for that. Um, let's see, I have, uh, so Young Kim from Radio Free Asia, who would like to ask you about North Korea. Um, she says, uh, North Korea continues to develop its nuclear and missile programs while the US DPRK diplomatic engagement seems to be pretty low key. Um, this sort of fits also in your discussion about the, where the various threats lie. Um, what is your, your comment on this? Do you have any thoughts on how North Korea fits into this picture of deterrence, arms control, proliferation? Well, North Korea is obviously in the in the category of semi rogue nations where uh, so far there hasn't been any really productive discussions. There were the meetings between their leader and President Trump, but they didn't really go anywhere. Uh, again, I, I think the beginning of uh, of successful negotiations is putting yourself in the other person's shoes. What is it North Korea wants? My guess is what they want more than anything else is regime stability and some assurance that uh, regime change is not on our agenda or South Korea's agenda. Whether assurances can be provided that will be sufficient to allow them to uh, diminish their nuclear program, which they view as a kind of insurance policy, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I don't. I wish I had I've been to South Korea. I, I've actually been to North Korea. But, into two or three feet across the demilitarized zone uh, uh, up at the DMZ, but um, I don't I, I don't have a clear answer to that except that pressure has to continue to be applied and and uh, uh, to me the best route is via direct talks between South Korea and North Korea uh, and and if they can. Uh, come to some uh, reasonable, uh, uneasy status quo that will reassure the North Korean regime, then perhaps that would lead to the possibility of some level of denuclearization. De de but uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very tough problem. Uh, and, and of course, we haven't talked about Iran yet. That's another, uh, another dilemma. There's plenty to work on. Um... Let me, you know, there's an interesting question here that brings together, I think, two areas of, of interest. You raised part of this in terms of 
uh, nuclear command and control. And the question has to do with, you know, how prominently does your expertise in cyber and the focus you've given that in part kind of undergird the focus that you put on NC3? Do you see it principally as a, as a cyber threat to NC3? Do you see those issues as closely connected or intertwined? Um, and how might you think about cyber attacks that could implicate it somehow our NC3 systems in terms of their, what they would represent in terms of uh, the type of attack they would be? I think they're very closely intertwined. Uh, I, I, the, our, uh, our commission, which was a very interesting one, it was appointed, it was created in the National Defense Act in 2019, and it has a really interesting structure. Four members of Congress, uh, uh, four members from the executive and six private sector individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just, we had our 47th meeting last night, as a matter of fact. Uh, this has been a very hands-on commission, uh, really uh, thoughtfully uh, trying to approach this problem. The short answer to your question is, uh, cyber is absolutely, the, to me, the most serious risk in terms of command and control. Uh, and the problem with cyber is it's never done. Uh, you can never say, okay, we're, you know, we've, we've done that, it's all, we're, we're safe, it's all secure, because the adversaries are working all the time uh, to try to undermine it. And the other problem with cyber is that it's cheap. I once did a calculation that Putin can hire 8,000 hackers for the price of one jet fighter. And so it's a low cost strategy and it also can be enormously debilitating. And so, uh, you know, we can, we can talk about focusing on command and control and the security of that system. But what if you know, what if the whole grid goes down? What if there's no power to the White House? I mean, I, I assume there are generators and those kinds of things, but the, 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 the opportunities for cyber mischief are only limited by our imagination. Uh, and so that's why I think it's, it's so critical to have redundancy on top of redundancy. Uh, because again, if the adversary believes that they can cripple our command and control, then the deterrent capability evaporates. All those submarines are out there and they have all those missiles on them, but they aren't gonna do anything because nobody's gonna be able to tell them what to do. And, and so that's why, I, that's why I say this ought to be, we ought to talk about the quad instead of the triad, uh, because I think that's so important. There's no question in my mind that the adversaries right this moment as we're speaking are thinking about and working on how to compromise uh, the cyber, the, the security of, of our uh, communications uh, system. That is a daunting problem. Um, well, again, sort of looking about the intersection of these various threats and challenges, uh, Brian Rosinski asks a question. Uh, he says, the uh, Biden administration has argued that we can no longer look at nuclear weapons in a vacuum, that China and Russia see nuclear weapons as part of an integrated toolkit. The administration's response to this includes an effort to better integrate the NPR and missile defense reviews with the national defense strategy process. How well equipped do you think Congress is to take a similarly integrated approach to deterrence, both in terms of thinking about adversaries and challenges in this way, but also in terms of managing and supporting uh, the investments that need to be made in an integrated strategy? Um, how would that well, affect? I, I think the premise of the question is absolutely correct, that uh, you can't, we, we can't think about nuclear policy over here and everything else, hypersonics, cyber over here. Uh, that's not the way our adversaries think of it. Uh, they're thinking of an, uh, the, the People's Liberation Army is thinking about a, a, a newly, I should say, they are they're they're sort of rediscover they're discovering Goldwater Nichols. I mean, they're talk they're thinking about how to reorganize to, to be in a more uh, strategically coherent uh, position. So, can the Congress adapt? Yes, I think so. Uh, uh, I, I certainly hope so. We've got some very good people engaged on this issue in both houses. Uh, my colleague Deb Fisher, uh, who's my I, I call her my vice chair. She's the ranking member of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. Uh, you know, she and I work together very closely. I don't think there are any, there's, there are some sort of partisan differences on these issues, but not, uh, not to any great extent, uh, not as much as on the, 
on the debt ceiling or on, you know, uh, the uh, the uh, reconciliation bill. But uh, but I think I think Congress is prepared to look on look at this on a more holistic basis. And I think that's important. I agree with the question, and, and I agree with the, the approach of the administration. As I say, uh, we can we can have nuclear deterrence, and it can hold. But if they can disable our entire carrier fleet in a matter of an hour in the in the uh, Western Pacific, uh, that's that's a that changes the the strategic calculus dramatically. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Great question, and and uh, and thought. Thanks for that thoughtful answer. Um, I'm checking here to double see you know, you know whether we've kind of captured most of the questions. We've gotten a lot of them. Um, you're moving between two systems and challenging my my technical capacity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You're doing fine. Uh, let's see. Um, well, I guess you know there's there's a couple there's two remaining questions, and I'll I'll, I'll kind of let let you consider um, how to think about those. One has to do with declaratory policy. And consideration of moving, it's probably one of the big issues to be considered as part of nuclear posture review and integrated strategy review. And it is related to how do we think about these integrated capabilities and when is it appropriate in any way to threaten nuclear use? So the question has to do with whether or not you support um, any changes to declaratory policy, particularly in the form of uh, no first use or sole purpose. Um, and that is it kind of how do you feel about that? Do you have any expectations or, or uh, opinions on, on that topic? Well, I've thought about no first use and, and it's tempting to articulate that as a policy. But again, I was, I was thinking about this as, as we were as preparing, preparing for this discussion. Part of deterrence is making your adversary nervous. You want your adversary to be a little unsure of what the policy is going to be, and therefore err on the side of caution. And uh, you know, I, I certainly hope that we would never use nuclear weapons first. I, I, I don't think that should be our policy. I don't think that is, is our policy. But ruling it out um, just slightly changes the adversary's calculus. And again, if you think about the whole idea of deterrence, is to uh, undermine the confidence of the adversary that they can be successful uh, in any conflict, uh, that's to, to me persuasive uh, that making that kind of statement is would, would not be in the national interest. Let me mention, by the way, when we talk so much about deterrence, one of the, one of the principal recommendations of our Cyber Solarium Commission was to develop a clear declaratory policy on deterrence in cyber because the problem in cyber has been over the past 15, 20 years, we've been a cheap date. We've been, uh, there've been no real consequences for significant cyber attacks against this country. And therefore they keep coming. As I said, it's cheap. Uh, and if they're not gonna be uh, struck back in some way, why not? And the striking back, by the way, doesn't have to be cyber for cyber, uh, but there has to be, the, uh, we want, someone sitting in the Politburo to say, boss, if we do this, they're gonna whack us in some way and we better think twice about it. Right now that calculus isn't being made. And so deterrence is not only applicable in the nuclear field and it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. I don't mean to imply that it is, it's not that simple, but, uh, but it is an important concept uh, in cyber as well. And so far, I think it's been the major strategic gap in our uh, cyber response uh, in in this country. Um, so uh, I, I I had to get that in. If you're going to talk about deterrence, if you're going to if you're going to say deterrence to me, you're going to get a, a cyber related answer. Absolutely, I understand. Makes perfect sense. Well, Senator, you have been incredibly generous with your time. I want to make sure we let you get on to the the business of your day uh, on schedule. But I have to say, you really kind of made it for the hometown girl here. Uh, and so it's, it's really fun to be able to talk about the thing I spend all day at work doing with uh, kind of a, a hero of a home state. So um, this has really been a fun morning for me and, and thank you so much for your time and thoughtfulness and, and the great sort of 
intellect and, and balance you bring to these issues. It's, it's really uh, a refreshing thing. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And it's been, it's been fun for me. And as I said, uh, if, if members of the audience have ideas or thoughts that they want to share, uh, uh, please reach out to my office. Uh, my uh, foreign policy staff is, is really top notch. Jeff Bennett is, is leads that and, and uh, be in touch with us. Uh, uh, I'm always interested in ideas and, and of course, always can use a little more education. So thanks again for the opportunity and uh, look forward to meeting with you again. Well, thank you so much, sir. And thank you to the audience. You put some great questions in there and it's really been a terrific discussion. So thank you. And I'm really thrilled to have you here. Um, we're gonna let the Senator depart the, uh, the virtual space and I will prepare, thank you, sir. Uh, I will prepare to hand the baton uh, for our next panel. Uh, we will have uh, three panels over the course of the conference as we discuss the nuclear trilemma. Uh, the next one will be looking at uh, a unified front, understanding partner and alliance views on US nuclear weapons policy. And with that, I would like to hand the baton to Pony Deputy Director, Eric Brewer, who will be chairing that first panel. So thank you for joining us for this opening keynote discussion. And uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation over the rest of today and tomorrow. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, and welcome everyone to the first panel of our conference. As Rebecca said, the title is A Unified Front, Understanding Partner and Alliance Views on US Nuclear Weapons Policy. I'm Eric Brewer, Deputy Director and Senior Fellow with the Project on Nuclear Issues and have the pleasure of moderating this discussion. Um, you know, during a slow news cycle, I think this topic would have provi provided sufficient uh, meat for debate but we are fortunately or unfortunately not in a slow news cycle when it comes to some major developments that have impact uh, on US alliances. Um, we're beginning with this panel uh, because you know, there's sort of an assumption and perhaps we can discuss and challenge this over the course of the panel that the views of allies are perhaps one of the most important ingredients that go into the ongoing US nuclear posture review and the policy considerations and decisions therein. Uh, the other reason we're leading with it is also because the Biden administration has made uh, revitalizing U.S. alliances a uh, central feature of its U.S. national security policy, although I'm sure, of course, we will debate um, how well it is doing on that front uh, during this discussion. So the central question really for this panel is when it comes to extended deterrence and assurance, what do allies want and what will they accept? We have an excellent group here uh, assembled with us virtually to help uh, lead this discussion and unpack this issue. We have Ambassador Evo Dalder, the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and former US ambassador to NATO from 2009 to 2013. Jessica Cox, director of the Nuclear Policy Directorate at NATO and former NSC director for arms control. Dr. Gina Kim, associate professor at Hancock University of Foreign Studies and previously a research fellow with the Korea Institute for Defense Analysis. And then finally, Hideshi Tokuchi, president of the Research Institute for Peace and Security and former Vice Minister of Defense for International Affairs, uh, among other positions uh, with Japan's Ministry of Defense. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Let's start uh, before we dive into some, some NPR type elements, let's start with current events. Because there's been two major developments over the past several weeks that have alliance impl implications, and some would also argue uh, implications for perceptions of US reliability. The first is, as we all know now, the establishment of uh, the AUKUS partnership between the US, UK, and Australia. Uh, that includes the, the uh, provision of nuclear-powered sub submarine technology to Australia. And the second uh, is the chaotic US withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, after a 20-year war there. So Ambassador Dalder, uh, let's start with you, and then we'll, we'll go to Jessica, I think. Um, we've, you know, we've seen the headlines. We've seen the, the French reaction to the AUKUS development. What does Europe make of this announcement? Is it something to be welcomed? Is it something to be feared? Uh, was this a natural evolution uh, to US uh, prioritization of the Indo-Pacific theater? Or was this a surprise and a shock uh, and something that might generate you know, greater desires for strategic autonomy from the United States? And on the Afghanistan side of the ledger, um, has the US mishandling of that withdrawal in the end of the war had any impact on how NATO countries view US reliability? And if so, how is that damage repaired? Uh, 
first of all, thanks, uh, Eric, uh, for for having me here and uh, for putting on this uh, this conference on a really important but often neglected topic. Although Jessica and I spent most of our lives thinking about these as well as uh, as well as everyone here, but it is a topic that tends to get ignored. Um, I, I think the answer to your to both questions is yes, uh, but then the question is how how do you think about that? So let's start start with an o overall assessment. So when you think about the relationship between uh, uh, allies, and particularly between the major security provider and those who are dependent uh, on that security providers, which is the United States and all of its allies, uh, there are two key issues uh, that uh, the United States and its allies always need to keep in mind. One is, how do you enhance deterrence of a common threat? And the second is, how do you enhance reassurance uh, of your allies? And these two uh, are uh, uh, factors is what what determines how alliances work. Uh, reassurance often is more difficult than deterrence for the very simple fact that in order to deter, particularly in a nuclear environment, a potential threat, there has to be some belief that the, that, uh, 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 the, the ally, by the, by the uh, adversary, that there will be a military response to whatever action is being taken. For reassurance purposes, some belief, some belief is not good enough. It has to be close to 100% certain in order to feel reassured. So that's the, that's the dilemma that one plays with. And we will come back to this over and over and over again. How do you enhance deterrence without undermining reassurance? How do you reassure without undermining deterrence? So AUKUS. Uh, AUKUS is fundamentally about enhancing deterrence in the Asia Pacific region uh, and bringing in for the first time to the Asia Pacific region a European power uh, as part of the alliance arrangement, in this case, the UK. Uh, the reason why Australia decided it needed to go to a different option when it came to submarine technology was part of its assessment back in 18 months ago that the security environment in the Indo-Pacific had fundamentally changed, uh, most specifically because of the rise of China, and that Australia needed to have the capacity to deal with that threat. It therefore, call for, for example, for the uh, um, procurement of long range strike capabilities. Uh, the nuclear propulsed submarines fit very clearly in that same kind of context. And uh, it's not surprising that the Australians decided that this is what they wanted, nor is it surprising that if you're gonna go this way, this, you, you go with the security provider of Australia, which is the United States, rather than a security partner, uh, which is France. So from a from a Australian perspective, from a UK perspective, and above all, from a US perspective, the idea of strengthening deterrence while reassuring, in this case, Australia and the UK, was uh, frankly a no-brainer and, 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 and uh, is widely regarded in the Asia Pacific. And, and, and Hideshi and, and Gina will, of course, uh, comment on this as a positive development for deterrence and reassurance. The problem is that you can't separate what happens in the Indo-Pacific from what happens in Europe. Uh, and, and for too long, American foreign policy uh, believe, has believed that you can silo what happens across the Atlantic and what happens across the Pacific. And in this case, it really went terribly wrong uh, because the reality was that uh, the French in particular saw themselves not just as a European, but also as an Indo-Pacific power. It has 2 million citizens, it has territory there, it has 7,000 troops, and it regarded the, the, the conventional submarine deal with Australia as the linchpin of its Indo-Pacific strategy. And rather than figuring out how you bring the, the French into uh, this conversation and make them part of that conversation, we, the United States, decided uh, to leave them out. Uh, and as a result, we've seen the reaction uh, by France uh, over the past week. We can argue whether that is justified. We can argue whether it is domestic politics. We can argue whether it's industrial policy. But what we can argue is that the United States acted in a way that the French perceived as breaching trust, that is undermining reassurance. So within that larger context, how do other Europeans feel about that? Well, uh, uh, of course, reassurance has been undermined for quite a long time now particularly under the Trump administration, which dealt with allies as uh, in a highly transactional way in which the issue was how much do you pay me to defend you rather than how do we uh, prepare for our own uh, common defense uh, together. 
that uh, trust was already being broken. Uh, the belief and hope was that a new administration would change all that. And indeed, the rhetoric that came out of uh, the Biden administration with regard to we are back and, and we have an alliance centered foreign policy was widely welcomed, including uh, in Europe during the June uh, 2021 trip by the president uh, to the G7, to the, an EU US summit, uh, and of course, a NATO uh, summit. Uh, but at the same time, developments, you know, uh, do have an impact. It's not enough to walk the walk. You got to talk the talk. It's not enough to talk the talk. You have to walk the walk. Uh, and Afghanistan, uh, which uh, uh, was a decision made in Washington and then communicated to our partners in uh, uh, in in Europe uh, and at NATO, and then this uh, AUKUS development both undermined the idea that the United States wants to work together with its allies to decide common security problems. It weakened, therefore, um, and, and I think in a, in a quite significant way, uh, the reassurance element of this, um, of this uh, way to think about alliances. And uh, even though deterrence may have been enhanced in the Indo-Pacific, I think overall, the relationship of the United States and Europe is weaker today than it was six months ago. Uh, it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of NATO. It's not the end of uh, of this discussion uh, at all. But if uh, if relationships between allies are based on trust, once trust is broken, it's hard to repair. Uh, and we've got a, a big job to do to start repairing it. Thank you, Ambassador. Jessica, I'd be curious, do you, do you kind of agree with that characterization? Would you also argue that these developments have kind of undercut US trust and credibility with, uh, with European allies? So um, I, I'm not gonna speak specifically to, to AUKUS, but I will just kind of take a step back and, and um, kind of keying off uh, Evo's final point about the broader environment that this decision was made in and the broader landscape here in Europe. Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, as Ivo said, the, the um, initial indications from the, the Biden administration were all very positive. Allies, you know, certainly uh, welcomed the end of the Trump era and the kind of back, going back to an allied centric and allied focused policies. But I think even from the various er, very early days of the administration, particularly in the nuclear domain, which is really what we're talking about here today, um, there have been real inklings that um, the U.S. might not be considering allies' views or consulting quite as closely uh, as allies would maybe uh, wish them to. And you see that, you know, from the first days of the decision to extend New START without any consultation with allies about what that would look like, um, to the release of the um, interim uh, national security guidance where the U.S., uh, had uh, you know kind of reintroduced the language about reducing the role of nuclear weapons. Um, Afghanistan certainly uh, you know has loomed large, although I think it, it, the decision on Afghanistan I think was actually quite well consulted. I think it was more the execution of the decision um, that where things kind of fell apart. But again, um, and now AUKUS is kind of another another example. Um, that allies have to point to say, you know, is the United States really taking into account European security? So I do think that, you know, there is deep paranoia from the, not just the Trump administration, but either, even further back, that European and U.S. Um, European and U.S. interests were starting to diverge. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, that, that this administration, the, the Biden administration, while they're saying lots of good things, um, haven't really, as Eva said, you know, really put their money where their mouths are uh, as yet. Um, I think China, is a, China in general is another indicator that allies are, are looking at very closely. What does this mean for the alliance? What does the U.S. want from, from NATO? Right now, it's not really clear. Does this mean there's a full shift to the Asia Pacific from the U.S. context and that Europe does need to take uh, on a bigger role for its, not just its defense, but also the deterrence of the threats that we face. So I think these are all, these are all the questions that are swirling around in the, in the minds of allies right now. That all said, you know, for the vast majority of allies, 
the United States is the security advisor, uh, provider of choice, right? Allies want to you know, be in lockstep with the United States. They want to be able to look to the United States, particularly in the nuclear domain as their key security provider. Um, uh, the, you know, the, as we say at NATO, you know, the strategic deterrence of the alliance, that is, our, that is a, from the United States. Is, is kind of the key to our to our security in the region. And so this is, you know, allies are want the US to engage. They want the United States to be the security provider. But I think that there are increasing frustrations that the United States isn't listening to allies and that they're not taking, that there may be sidelining the European theater um, with an increased focus on, on the, the Asia Pacific. And I would just say, you know, as an anecdotal point, I was in um, at the Baltic Security Conference last week uh, in um, in Vilnius, and I can't uh, even describe the number of officials and participants uh, at, in that forum, which was largely focused on the Baltic region. Of course, um, that questioned you know U.S. deterrence and whether or not the U.S. really was committed to its security. So, so I do think that these questions that have been kind of bubbling underneath the surface. Are, are starting to rise. And um, particularly as we see the US um, nuclear posture review uh, get underway, as we start negotiating um, NATO's new strategic concept, which is our kind of guiding document uh, for the next 10 years, I think that these issues are really likely to come to the forefront uh, in potentially very divisive ways, which would not only be a problem and a challenge for the Alliance, but also for security more broadly, not just in Europe, but in, but you know, more more broadly globally. So let me just stop there and leave it at that. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. I, I want to turn to Gina and Hideshi now. Um, Gina Hideshi, sort of, what is your sense of the reaction uh, to the Indo-Pacific region uh, on the AUKUS announcement? Um, want to get your take there, but also want to get your your take on the what would seem perhaps less relevant, which is the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, despite what, what Ivo and Jessica have said about the impact of that on, on, uh, on Europe and NATO, there's also a case to be made perhaps that that withdrawal um, strengthens, uh, you know, confidence in the United States and, and its ability to now shift focus of, of attention and resources over to East Asia. Um, but let's start with Gina. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, actually, there was a lot of tension paid to the US, UK, and Australia starting a new uh, security cooperation to put more pressure on China. So South Korea noted that uh, military contributions as an, as an ally, such as participation in the Quad, for example, will become an important issue in the coming months or years. So far, South Koreans uh, believed that there would be uh, enough time to take uh, uh, to think about uh, clear positions on this issue, but there will be more discussions on uh, South Korea's role in the global partnership led by the U.S. Well, um, interestingly, uh, South Korea was interested in the uh, in the fact that U.S. and and U.K. had agreed to supporting uh, Australia's acquisition of nuclear powered submarines. The development of a nuclear powered submarine is a promise made by President uh, Moon Jae-in um, uh, during the presidential election. And President Moon once said, uh, the time has come for us to have a nuclear powered submarine. So um, actually it is impossible to obtain enriched uranium uh, for nuclear uh, part of submarine reactors, unless the U.S. understands it. So the Korea-U.S. Uh, atomic energy agreement is for uh, domestic, uh, sorry, civilian use of uh, the nuclear uh, power plants and et cetera. So it is not uh, applicable to uh, military use of any kind. Um, the U.S. is wary of uh, broadening the interpretation of uh, this uh, decision to provide Australia a uh, nuclear power submarine, uh, saying that it is an exception, but the possibility of introducing nuclear power submarine uh, will be a hotly debated issue in South Korea for a while. 
And on the issue of Afghanistan, I think it is not fair to compare Afghanistan as a, and a treaty-based ally like South Korea with a sixth largest military power and 10th largest economy in the world. South Korea is different from Afghanistan in many other ways. The uh, 1953 treaty between the US and the ROC confirms uh, that the allies will consult and make agreement to implement the treaty of mutual defense. So it is so ironic that some conservatives in South Korea who seem to have faith in the alliance argue that the government should take the Afghanistan case as a lesson and do whatever it takes to maintain a strong military relationship. That sounds like an expression of anxiety to me. And there were also voices calling for the ROC to expand its role and, and accordingly increase its value um, immediately in increasing burden sharing, et cetera. But the true lessons learned from the Afghanistan case is that South Korea should not depend solely on the US for its security. And it has to uh, continue strengthen its own national defense capabilities. And that will also be something that the US wants to hear from the allies as well. Capable member of the global partnership that the US want to maintain under the Biden administration. Uh, let me uh, stress this, the credibility of the US security policy um, under the President uh, Trump was low because of low predictability. The decision was a controversial uh, issue in South Korea for quite some time when President Trump announced that he would suspend rugged military exercises shortly after the Singapore summit. What many people in South Korea were interested in was not whether the suspension of the joint exercises was a consens uh, concession to North Korea, but whether there was a prior consultation between the ROG and the US indeed. And allies cannot always agree on every issue and the advantage of an alliance is that it uh, promotes understanding in the process of sharing information when there is a difference in each other's position. So close consultation increases pre predictability. So I would like to stress predictability. And I think people in South Korea who feel really good about coordination at various levels right now. Thank you, Gina. Hideshi, um, can you give us Japan's perspective on these developments? You're muted. You're, you're muted. Well, uh, first of all, let me thank uh, CSIS and particularly Eric for inviting me in uh, this uh, very important and timely event. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, go first with uh, AUKUS. Uh, five to six years ago, uh, the Japanese government was competing with uh, France and Germany in order to gain the uh, development pro, uh, project of uh, Australian submarines uh, in vain. So uh, I think that the Japanese government and the Japanese business and Japanese people are carefully watching the development of the AUKUS, particularly uh, on the uh, nuclear powered submarine uh, project. But in my mind, AUKUS is not just about uh, delivering a nuclear uh, powered submarine fleet for Australia. The submarine project is just the first initiative of the uh, newly born trilateral framework. And uh, AUKUS is not just about advanced technologies. Uh, of course, uh, it would be wonderful if they cooperate, say in the uh, areas of uh, AI or cyber, uh, but the framework is even beyond that. Uh, AUKUS will be added to the two uh, box uh, to bolster the rules-based international order, uh, order uh, in, order, uh, in the Indo-Pacific and to achieve a, a free and open Indo-Pacific in the light of China's um, increasingly assertive and even aggressive behaviors uh, at sea and elsewhere. Uh, geographically, Australia is far from China, uh, but it faces both the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. Uh, therefore, Australia is truly an Indo-Pacific power. Uh, China's maritime expansion to the Pacific, the South China Sea, 
and uh, the Indian Ocean has caused a big concern uh, among the Australians and also China's increasing uh, influence uh, on the South Pacific Island region where Australia has a large interest is also a concern for them. Uh, Australia has been also subject to China's uh, economic coercion uh, espionage and interference operations. So it is almost cliche that Australia uh, is a canary in the coal mine. So uh, the most important instrument to ensure uh, the peace and the stability of the Indo-Pacific is uh, the US-centered alliance network uh, in the region, including of course the Japan-US alliance relationship and the robust uh, US force presence uh, based on the alliances but it is not enough to uh, counter the uh, emerging challenges. Partnership of like-minded countries is increasingly important. And right now, the region has several frameworks in addition to the US Alliance Network, uh, such as ASEAN-based frameworks like uh, AF, ADMM, and ADMM Plus, and EAS. And beyond that, uh, also the region has, for example, FPDA, and um, most recently, the Quad. Uh, networking of these existing networks is of an urgent necessity and probably AUKUS uh, will be added to the list of post multiplier uh, of the US Alliance Network and uh, also will be instrumental to keep the UK uh, engaged in the Indo-Pacific. And it is very unfortunate that uh, France got angry about the submarine project. However, uh, France is a Pacific power anyway, uh, having territories in various places in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it has vested interests in the region, including in the vicinity of Australia. So I would like to add uh, three more points. Uh, first, uh, the French presidential election will be held uh, next uh, April. Uh, the ruling party lost in the local elections in June. Uh, an expert says that even if President Macron is re-elected, uh, the ruling party may not win the lower house election uh, because of uh, its low approval rate. The French internal politics may have uh, influenced the diplomacy. And second, the French project didn't go well. Cancellation of the uh, French uh, you know, uh, project was easily expected and it was just a matter of time. And the cost got swollen to three times as much as uh, Australia's annual defense budget. And one of the big uh, merits of the French deal to Australians was job creation in Australia, uh, but it was not going well. And in addition, already the development project is behind uh, the schedule. And if the pro uh, project becomes three years behind the schedule, Australia will not have any submarines in the Navy. Uh, in uh, sometime in future, so the cancellation seemed inevitable. Uh, even with the US and British cooperation, the new uh, development project will take much, much time. Uh, it's increasingly important for the like-minded uh, countries to fill the gap in order not to create any power vacuum at sea. And third and finally, soon after uh, the uh, AUKUS announcement by the three countries, China filed an application to uh, join the CPTPP. Uh, although I do not think that China's uh, participation uh, to the CPTPP uh, comes anytime soon, the sequence of the two events uh, might have caused an impression among the regional countries that China is interested in economic uh, engagement while the US is more interested in uh, military uh, muscle flexing. I think that's a false image, but we have to be careful about it because those who depend much on China uh, for their economic uh, benefits are likely to believe so. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, closer exchanges with ASEAN is increasingly important. Uh, so we have to assure them that we uh, respect their centrality, I think. And uh, let me say uh, only a few words uh, about uh, Afghanistan. Is it okay? Quickly, yes, yeah. 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 Um, I think that um, the, uh, the efforts uh, for 
Actually, the situation in Afghanistan always reminds me of an English word, Afghanistanism. Uh, I think that uh, uh, it was uh, coined in the 1960s. Uh, it's an old word, but in today's world, Afghanistan is not as remote as uh, 60 years ago. Uh, the uh, efforts for dramatic uh, democratic nation building were worthwhile, but it takes a long, long time. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, 20 years was enough for Afghanistan. Uh, probably Afghanistan needed much more time after a long time division and the poverty. However, you have to think twice if the US should have continued to stay uh, there in today's great power competition. Uh, we had to be uh, candid about how big or small uh, the strategic uh, importance of Afghanistan is in today's world, particularly in the age of great power competition. If the US kept committed to the corrupt government and unmotivated uh, uh, military forces and to ineffective uh, eradication of uh, poppy production uh, by investing uh, you know, huge amount of money just to grow drug markets, then the US credibility uh, would suffer a lot more. Although I uh, believe that the US should have planned much more carefully, uh, President Biden is right in saying that Afghan uh, political leaders gave up and fled uh, the country, that the Afghan military collapsed, and sometimes without trying to fight. So it's a serious cave uh, caveat to uh, US allies, uh, particularly the Japanese, uh, that uh, American troops cannot and shouldn't fight in a war and dying in a war that uh, Afghan forces are not willing uh, to fight for themselves. That's uh, from a Japanese perspective. That is not a matter of US security commitment, but a matter of uh, Japan's determination to defend itself and a uh, matter of uh, allies' determination to defend themselves. Thank you, Dashi. That's an interesting observation there at the end. Um, let's. I want to turn now to the, the nuclear posture review, um, which, is, which is underway. And I think per, perhaps here we'll, we'll go in reverse order of what we just did before. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, like past NPRs, uh, obviously the U.S. is going to and sort of already is uh, soliciting allied views um, on uh, the policies that are, that are going to come out of this and the decisions that have to be made. And so this begs several questions um, I'd like to put to the group here. Uh, what aspects of that review are of most concern to allies? Are those concerns shared um, across the sort of the array of US uh, alliances in uh, Europe and in, in Asia? Um, or are there lots of divergences? Um, and then, you know, what are allies looking for in this review specifically? Is it concrete outcomes? Is it just that their voices have been heard and, and sort of taken into account? Uh, if it is concrete outcomes, what do they want to achieve? And perhaps equally important, what outcomes do they want to avoid? Um, so that's a that's kind of a, a broad array of questions, uh, but I think they're all they're all quite interesting. Uh, let's go ahead and start with Hideshi. Uh, we'll go we'll we'll go in reverse order. And Hideshi, I'd be particularly curious to hear your thoughts on, uh, you know, given that Japan has um, objected to uh, a no first use doctrine in the past, do you think they would have similar concerns about uh, a sole purpose uh, doctrine? Well, um, I'm not so sure whether I can uh, directly address your question or not, but um, as an ally of the United States, uh, Japan has a big stake in the US works on a new uh, national defense strategy and a new uh, nuclear posture review, particularly because of the following two reasons. Uh, first, uh, Japan is a frontline state in the age of the accelerating uh, great power competition. China is, growing, uh, its, uh, China is growing its nuclear arsenal in numbers and technological uh, capacity. And Russia uh, continues to expand uh, its uh, nuclear weapons arsenal, including low yield uh, tactical uh, ones. Two, uh, Japan is surrounded by two nuclear powers and one de facto nuclear uh, uh, state. So uh, the US declaration to address uh, the existential threat posed by nuclear uh, weapons and to re-establish US credibility as a leader in arms control is appreciated. And there are four questions. Uh, first, uh, what does it mean to reduce the role of nuclear weapons 
uh, in the United States national security strategy while ensuring uh, US external deterrence commitments to its allies uh, remain strong and credible. Uh, it sounds nice, but what steps does the US take uh, to do? Uh, that's a question. Uh, second, uh, the US declaration to engage uh, in a meaningful dialogue with Russia and China on a range of emerging military technological developments that implicate uh, strategic uh, stability is good, but uh, it is a challenging job to engage uh, China. So what is the prospect of it? Nuclear uh, and missile issue seems overshadowed by, overshadowed by uh, other issues. For example, economic statecraft, uh, COVID-19, climate change, and most recently by Afghanistan. Uh, in the meantime, China is doubling or even more the number uh, of uh, nuclear uh, warheads, uh, seeing the uh, 16 silos in Jiranta in the Inner Mongolia and uh, 119 silos in Yumen in Gobi Desert and uh, 111, 110 uh, new silos in, uh, you know, Hami, uh, 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 Hami in uh, Eastern Xinjiang. Uh, so, um, uh, it's a very uh, uh, big concern. And also China is developing, you know, uh, missile defense capability and so on and so on. So uh, the, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, you know, also, uh, you know, uh, addressing a belligerent North Korea uh, is not a matter of a proliferation any longer. It's a matter of deterrence. Uh, denuclearization proved to be a hollow and bogus uh, commitment of North Korea. And in January, North Korea uh, declared uh, his intent, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Kim Jong un declared uh, his intention uh, to develop uh, hypersonic gliding flight uh, uh, warheads and tactical nuclear weapons. He said so. And uh, also preemptive and uh, retaliatory nuclear strike capabilities in spite of their uh, triple distress. Uh, for Kim Jong-un, uh, the nuclear weapon uh, is indispensable tool for their regime survival and family survival, uh, as our goal is not to live with a nu nuclear arm North Korea, uh, but to uh, achieve complete uh, denuclearization of North Korea. Uh, the North Korea uh, factor will affect the U.S. engagement in meaningful dialogue with Russia and China. And uh, finally, uh, deployment of ground-based uh, intermediate-range missiles. Uh, the U.S. nuclear guarantee uh, has uh, to be tangible. As someone already proposed introduction of the new generation of INF uh, system, now under development by the United States to the Japanese territory uh, or uh, near there, uh, would uh, firm up the credibility of the extended deterrence and uh, send an ambiguous, an ambiguous message uh, to ho uh, hostile regional powers. And this issue uh, must be carefully managed Consider, uh, considering uh, its impact on Japan's domestic politics, but strategic com uh, uh, consideration uh, must be prioritized. Uh, this is my <laughs> purely my own uh, thought, but um, uh, uh, I stop here. Thank you, Hideshi. Uh, Gina, let's turn to you. I'd be curious on what your view is from uh, South Korea's perspective on what types of, what is a satisfactory outcome for the nuclear posture of you? I'd also be curious in your remarks here to hear whether you see any differences between um, different political camps, uh, different, different sides of the political spectrum within South Korea on desirable outcomes uh, for, the, for the NPR. Okay. Um, uh, years before the uh, NPR was released, the US uh, was consulting with its allies, including South Korea. And in the case of South Korea, we have uh, extended deterrence policy committee, uh, deterrence strategy committee, and we have annual TTX. And the US reflects South Korea's position as much as possible and coordinates messages, especially toward North Korea. 
before uh, the U.S. issues NPR, South Koreans actually pay attention to specific issues. There are at least uh, three things. Uh, first, threat assessment, whether or not North Korea's threats uh, from nuclear and missile program is identified as one of the most dangerous security threats. That's important. And experts in South Korea were so much relieved that the uh, 2018 NPR defined North Korea's nuclear capability as a grave and immediate, uh, imminent uh, threat and emphasized unwavering commitment to extended deterrence to reassure its allies. Second, um, declaratory policy, whether the US, like it did in, in the past, rejects the sole purpose of nuclear weapons. That's important as well, because uh, many in South Korea believe that it's better to signal that nuclear weapons can be used in various situations. South Korea pays attention to uh, many types of provocations easily carried out by North Korea based on probably confidence in nuclear armament. Of course, there should be a calculated ambiguity but whether the U.S. implies that nuclear use is possible to deter, uh, especially WMD threats, that also matters. Um, third, what is equally important is the level of consult uh, consultation mechanism. South Korea cares about what message the U.S. sends regarding the prospect of strengthening its bilateral um, uh, uh, dialogue on extended deterrence as a central component of the U.S. Uh, nuclear posture. South Korea wants to be assured that the U.S. will not revise its extended deterrence policy without close consultation with its allies. It is because in reality, the extent to which allies in Asia can participate in the nuclear policy decision-making process uh, in case of emergency is quite, quite limited. So dialogue, consultation, and confirmation of US commitment, the software component of extended deterrence becomes quite important. And uh, if I add one more thing, South Korea also pays attention to uh, opportunities to increase its role in extended deterrence. So when the US NPR came out in 2018, South Koreans were very much curious about the idea of integrating conventional and nuclear capabilities in replacing the DCA uh, with the F-35 along with upgrading uh, B-61. That's because uh, South Korea also purchased F-35 from the US. And uh, what we don't want to hear is um, increasing chances of misperception and misunderstanding by neighboring countries. The U.S. will continue to strengthen its missile defense capabilities for the allies to effectively deter uh, North Korea's missile threats and the regional powers, which is good. But South Korea also wants to ensure that strengthening regional missile defense cooperation will not be mistaken for um, South Korea's joining the U.S. missile defense. So, um, and uh, currently, uh, we don't talk much about uh, the next NPR, uh, perhaps in, in the coming months, uh, when we uh, talk more about uh, security and foreign policy uh, between the two uh, parties before the election, then we may have that uh, issue on the agenda. Thank you, Gina. Jessica, um, you've been involved in several NPRs now from different sort of purchase within the US government. Um, how do you think those past efforts will compare to this one when it comes to allied concerns and what they're looking for? So I think that um, NATO allies are pretty united in the concerns that it has about the um, current US NPR process. And I think they have three major concerns. One, as I think has already been outlined, is a change in US declaratory policy that could undermine uh, extended deterrence uh, commitments and requirements, uh, including adoption of a sole purpose um, policy, which frankly is not well understood or, or explained uh, to, and has not been really explained to NATO allies. Um, and so that's a concern. The second area is um, what does reduce the role mean? 
right? So while this might be okay for the United States, which has a significant amount of conventional capabilities that could potentially uh, stand in and, and really enhance its own deterrence, from a NATO perspective, we've spent the last you know, five or six years increasing the role of nuclear deterrence for the alliance's broader security. And so um, walking back from extended deterrence and the role of nuclear weapons for uh, security of the alliance is problematic for, for a number of reasons at NATO. And then the third concern with the current NPR is um, any steps, uh, unilateral steps by the United States uh, to reduce the number or types of nuclear weapons in the arsenal uh, without any kind of binding or reciprocal agreements um, specifically with Russia. And this includes, of course, kind of some of the early debates on the ICBMs and some of the debates there, but it also means, uh, it also is uh, the biggest concern, of course, is the B-61s in Europe and the European theater that the US deploys there, um, but also um, the uh, sea launch cruise missile capability that, um, that was quite popular amongst European allies that the, that the Trump administration announced in its uh, NPR in, in 2018. So these are kind of some of the broad concerns that the allies have um, about, the, about the NPR itself and the decision-making the United States might undertake. Um, and I think we're seeing, you know, the, a kind of a, a confluence with my, with my last remarks uh, about, the, about the broader political dynamics and the kind of uh, thinking and increasing concern that US security interests and what the United States wants uh, is gonna trump uh, what European allies um, think they need for their own security. And, and I would say that this is not just a concern in kind of the traditional countries of the Baltic regions or Poland, but is becoming a much, a much broader concern, extended deterrence concern. So allies um, certainly in the Black Sea region uh, have, this, have this concern as they look at an increasing threat from Russia and others as well. Um, and we're also, you know, a number of, um, in particular, our DCA allies are worried about where some of these um, debates will, will uh, come out in the United States because of their own internal political dynamics with domestic populations that are increasingly antagonistic to nuclear deterrence and their participation in the DCA mission. At the same time where you have, uh, you know, the US saying it wants to reduce the role of nuclear weapons that puts a lot of these allies in very difficult political positions, um, which we'll uh, see very clearly in Germany in the coming weeks uh, as they have a, a, new, um, a new national government that gets formulated a following election. And so there's real concern that, that the, this confluence of factors, the, the US desire to reduce the role and potentially even reduce the numbers of, of nuclear weapons deployed in Europe, uh, combined with these domestic political pressures um, will create a climate where um, NATO's, that really undermines NATO's DCA mission and our, and our nuclear sharing arrangements. Um, and while I don't think that this will cause any kind of new nuclear outbreaks in, in the European theater, what I do think we'll see is a number of allies that have real um, concerns, not only about US extended deterrence commitments, but about NATO's broader deterrence commitments to those allies. And we might see a number of them start to seek out other security guarantees that would be much more destabilizing, including um, you know, the development and deployment of um, long range conventional munitions on Eastern territory, things like that, which I think could really, could really have some um, tremendously destabilizing effects in Europe. So, so that's really where, um, where the, the big concerns are within the NATO alliance. Uh, I think the allies right now understand that there is a lot of dynamics going on. Uh, they've been um, kind of a, a lenient with the US government as, as the process has been slow to get started and, and some of the consultations have been, have been um, you know, slower to get on the ground, get off the ground. Uh, but I think as we go into the fall and um, allies are increasingly concerned about some of these issues and how they'll play out, we'll start seeing a, a much bigger desire to have these discussions and these debates, um, not just individually and on a bilateral basis, but also in the context of NATO more broadly 
and what it means for the Alliance as, a, as an institution. Thank you, Jessica. And you, you've actually like prompted a, another question that I was hoping to get at at some point in this conversation. Um, and I do want to push you on this a little bit, and then maybe we'll go over to, to Ivo for his take. Um, you know, so I, I hear you talking about, um, you know, sort of like long term concerns with with regard to where some of these dynamics may be going. Um, you know, I've heard, um, you know, there's you and I think others talked about a general sense of relief from allies when uh, when when President Trump left office. But yet, the the the, um, the policies and the execution of the Biden administration perhaps have not lived up to some expectations, or have gone off in different directions that 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 have alarmed allies. I, I'm just you know particularly because of some of the dynamics you drew out, Jessica, because of some of their implications, and you know there's other sort of follow-on proliferation implications in other regions. I guess how are allies grappling with you know, and this is kind of central to the 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 theme of this conference, right? How are allies grappling with a, a, a US that may, you know, is, is increasingly polarized politically, um, that, that may have, you know, maybe more unpredictable in some of its behaviors. Uh, how, how are allies thinking about this over the long term when it comes to uh, questions of, of reliability uh, and, and how extended deterrence works? Um, Jessica, you may have a quick thought there, or, or, or we can come back and then we can go to Evo. Uh, and then also Gina and Hadesh, if you have thoughts on that topic as well. So I'll, I'll just say something very briefly. You know, I mean, I think that in general, you know, allied governments change all the time, including the United States. And, we, and all governments go through go through cycles and of ups and downs of more and less you know, commitments to the alliance, um, different political parties are in power. So, so NATO in, in general is very adaptable and, and open to change, including change in, in the U.S. administration. Um, you know, I think, it, you know, I will kind of comment specifically on, on Trump particularly, but, but I do think that there is a, there is a view that this administration um, wants to engage and work with allies. I think the, the issue is not that um, allies see the United States is less reliable or, or predictable. I think the issue is that the, the, the worry is, is that the United States and their security interests and their focus is going to be divergent from that of the allies in the region. And, and I think you know, the US has always had a global approach and, and you know, the European theater has been one part of that. But if the United States does make a huge shift away from the European theater towards the Asia Pacific, where does that leave allies? Does that mean that we need to rely increasingly on the United Kingdom and, and even France for extended deterrence? There's all sorts of baggage associated with that. Um, I don't think that there's a sense that the United States is in any way gonna walk away from NATO or extended deterrence or anything like that. But as, our, as the US, um, security focus shifts, what does that mean for NATO and for our, for specifically for our role in the European theater, particularly as Russia is not going away. And in fact, Russia is in the business right now creating new security challenges and new security dilemmas for the alliance. So, so do European NATO allies need to, need to do something differently? Is the United States, with the United States, not against them, to, to deal with both of these challenges um, as we see a, a more you know, multipolar world. So, so I think it we're in this another period of turn and change. I think NATO is quite adaptable um, and maybe I'm optimistic, but I, I don't think that it'll be you know, the end of the alliance or anything like that. But I do think we need to, we are in this process of having to figure this out right now. And it looks messy. Thank you, Jessica. Evo, I, I apologize. I kind of diverted the question mid Mid round, so please uh, pick up and run with that wherever you'd like. I know you've you've written recently on some of these topics, so uh, welcome your thoughts here. Well, it depends on how how recently. Um, I've been writing about it since 1979, so it's been a, been a while, uh, in, in one form or another. Uh, so a, a couple of points. One is I, I I think it's very important that we not assume that the allies have a view or a singular view, and that's true for every single ally. And it is uh, true for the, the allies among themselves. So yes, allies may 
in certain contexts, in certain committees, and in certain conversations express one set of concerns, but they will express in other committees and other situations a different set of concerns. So I can be, I can uh, say that the allies universally are worried about the breakdown of the arms control regime, uh, including uh, the fact that the INF treaty uh, is no longer uh, in, uh, in force. Uh, and, and so um, uh, we have had a tendency in the United States to think about allies and their views on uh, nuclear weapons solely within the extended deterrence framework and not within the larger framework in which nuclear weapons are part of the national security strategy. Uh, and I think we have to be very careful that we don't uh, uh, typify the allied view as being singular in one direction when it comes uh, to nuclear posture uh, discussions and negotiations, which is why when uh, I put together this, this task force that was run by Chuck Hagel and Kevin Rudd uh, and uh, Malcolm Rifkind, uh, we stressed as the most important way to reassure allies is to bring them into the NPR process. And when we talk about that, that's not just the nuclear priesthood, which normally gets involved in this and the people in DOD, but the allies writ large. And to have these discussions in, in great detail. And to take one example on, on the sole purpose issue probably the most misunderstood phrase we've had in a very long time. As someone who's spent a lot of time thinking about sole purpose, uh, uh, including uh, prior to, uh, uh, during the, the Obama election campaign, and then of course in the, uh, in the Obama NPR, it is simply not the case that sole purpose is the same thing as no first use. Sole purpose is a force posture uh, concept. Why do you have nuclear weapons? No first use is a declaratory policy. When will you use nuclear weapons? Those two are not the same. Uh, they're very different. Uh, it is a recognition that maybe uh, one needs to size the forces according to the purpose for which one has them. Now there's a debate about sole purpose and non-sole purpose. And there was a debate in the Obama administration and indeed the NPR in the end did not embrace sole purpose uh, at the time, but embraced it as a goal. Uh, and Vice President Biden then embraced it uh, as a goal for uh, uh, for his for for the future when uh, when the Obama administration left office. So that's one area where having detailed, consistent discussions with our allies at a high political level, not at a bureaucratic level, at a high political level, is extraordinarily important. The last major NATO statement. Uh, on nuclear weapons, other than communiques, which is a, which again is a bureaucratic exercise, was in 2010, at the time that we, the U.S. released the NPR, uh, and led to the Estonia, uh, Tallinn Declaration on the five purposes for uh, NATO nuclear weapons. Uh, five purposes, by the way, fully consistent with sole purpose, fully consistent with reducing the role of nuclear weapons fully consistent with extended deterrence and fully consistent with rejecting a no first use doctrine. Um, uh, and, but that was done at a foreign minister's meeting and it was debated for two hours at a foreign minister's meeting. And so uh, I think the, the, if, if we think about reassurance as an important concept, bringing allies into, into that conversation from day one at a high political level is extraordinarily important. The moment an NPR or any of these documents become bureaucratically uh, written and, and, and discussed uh, entities and then sort of brought up as finalized documents is the moment you lose control over extraordinarily important ways in which you communicate uh, to allies on these issues. And that is true for our allies in Asia as it is true for our allies in NATO. And indeed, one of the reasons we did the study we did, we wanted to bring allies in Europe and Asia together because they're confronting, when it comes to nuclear issues, very similar questions. Uh, and these questions are frankly too important to be left to the normal way in which uh, we have dealt with nuclear weapons issues for a long time. 
Um, the kind of debate we had in the late 70s and early 80s in NATO was a very healthy debate about the reassurance uh, of, uh, uh, of extended deterrence. And so I think that's how to think about it. Unfortunately, I don't think that's what's happening in, at, at the present time. Uh, I, I do hope that the administration will do what, uh, what we did in 2009 and 2010, which is to combine the NPR discussion with our strategic concept discussion which we're ongoing at the same time, and that we merge at least the nuclear and the arms control elements as part of that in those discussions. But that requires, that requires a discussion at NATO that takes place at foreign defense and leader levels. Uh, and you have to uh, have that conversation at that kind of level uh, in order to really get to the fundamental point about where the political compromise between the various factors that must influence leaders in these decisions, uh, both the, the hardware and the software, the arms control and, and, and the posture issues uh, need to come together. And that can only happen at that, at that level. And we need to therefore have allies involved in that discussion at that level. Uh, that's how you build reassurance uh, in, in the true sense of the word, when you are developing your own thinking in concert with uh, your allies who, by the way, for 95% drive why, how we think about nuclear weapons. It's extended deterrence that drives much of what we do uh, in the United States. It's the protection of our allies as opposed to protection of the homeland, which is a, you know, uh, an easier proposition uh, from a deterrence perspective and certainly from a reassurance perspective um, that you need to bring them in. And we haven't done that enough um, and we need to do it more. Thank you. That's really, really, really useful insights. Um, I do want to turn it, Gina uh, or Hideshi. Do you do you have thoughts on sort of what Jessica and Ivo have said? I mean, particularly with regard to these types of high level conversations that Ivo is talking about. Is are these types of things that you think would be useful in the, in the Asia context? Hideshi, go ahead. You're nodding. Go ahead. Okay. Oh. Uh, by the way, uh, I read uh, the work which uh, Dr. Ivo Darda just mentioned uh, with much interest, and uh, it was very inspiring and encouraging. Uh, I liked uh, that article. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Darda. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, nice to see you <laughs> after a long while. But um, actually, uh, let me start with like this. Um, in terms of the US commitment, and uh, credibility, uh, US credibility and predictability, probably I am, uh, I belong to a very uh, optimistic uh, Japanese group. Uh, but uh, I'd like to point out that Japan is a, in a very unique position uh, because Japan hosts uh, more than 50,000 US troops uh, on its own soil. Uh, including uh, USS Ronald Reagan, who imported in Yokosuka. Uh, probably Japan has been providing the most dependable stationing environment uh, for the uh, US forces. And uh, if uh, the permanent US military uh, presence uh, couldn't be considered as the proof of uh, US commitment, any commitment, uh, would be uh, hollow. Uh, however, a robust force uh, presence like that is not, of course, not enough as a guarantee, uh, particularly after allies uh, saw in the United States of the past four years, uh, a population that no longer seemed committed to uh, global uh, engagement. Um, and also, as I said, you know, Japan now faces more aggressive and assertive uh, nuclear armed neighbors. Uh, in light of this environment, three uh, things are necessary. And first, uh, Japan and the United States will have to consult with each other uh, on the issues of effectiveness of uh, nuclear deterrent and communication system. Uh, particularly, you know, joint exercises that uh, include a nuclear dimension uh, should be uh, explored and planned too. And second, um, 
a wide variety of means of alliance uh, deterrence must be provided in a seamless way. Uh, I say this because of the following reason. Uh, one of the urgent security uh, concerns among the Japanese is to stop China's maritime uh, gray zone uh, operations. Nuclear big sticks uh, wouldn't be credible to stop those uh, operations that doesn't uh, amount, uh, that do not amount to armed attack against Japan. Um, uh, so, a uh, seamless posture uh, leading to nuclear deterrent uh, must be built. And this point must be included in the consultation uh, between the two countries. And third, uh, consultation uh, on uh, these points must be done very, of course, very carefully and uh, quietly to ensure strategic thinking among experts of both countries. But at the same time, uh, it must be done so that the public will continue to be assured. So uh, the balance uh, between uh, the quiet dialogue and assurance to the public by open dialogue, both are important. Gina, would you like to comment? Yes, I think I already I already said that I believe uh, strengthening consultative mechanisms such as information sharing, policy coordination, and dialogue is more important than hardware components to increase assurance. But um, many South Korean experts may have a different idea. Um, I did some survey on this issue a couple of years ago. The response of uh, South Korean and American uh, experts to the question of what they think is the most important thing in extended deterrence on the Korean Peninsula uh, were very, very interesting to me. The U.S. experts view that shared threat perception and close consultation is the most important element, but the majority of South Korean experts believe that it is important to increase visibility through uh, for the deployment of U.S. strategic assets, for example, probably because it carries uh, uh, some you know meaning regarding U.S. commitment in the in the defense of uh, regional allies. I think there should be uh, um, efforts to share a common understanding that extend deterrence is a combination of so many tools. So in that regard, uh, getting allies to be part of the NPR process, I think that's very important for education. Thank you. I wanna turn to a topic, probably our last one before we go out to the audience for, for Q&A. So maybe we can touch on this quickly. We've already touched on it in some regards. So um, also audience members, please feel free to uh, enter your questions into the, the Q&A function. Um, and it's this question of uh, the role of conventional capabilities in deterrence and reassurance. Um, you know, each of you has kind of mentioned this in passing. I know, I think you, when you talked about these high-level consultations, I think you emphasized as well, going beyond kind of this nuclear priesthood, talking about arms control, talking about, I, I take it to be conventional capabilities as well. Um, so, uh, and my guess is there might be some, some, some difference perhaps between all of you in, in the precise role and the desirability of, of conventional capabilities for deterrence. Um, but perhaps we can we can go to you, Evo, and, and start with there, since you had that last comment on that type of, uh, of broadening out this conversation beyond just sort of nuclear deterrence. So I'm, I'm a firm believer that having strong conventional capabilities enhances deterrence, uh, enhances nuclear deterrence, enhances extended deterrence. Uh, there are times some people have made an opposite argument that conventional weaknesses uh, increases reliance on nuclear weapons and therefore enhances deterrence in, in that way. I don't, I, I've never really bought into that. Um, whether that's, you know, in the old framework of the Cold War or in, in the current framework, I think it's very important uh, that allies contribute uh, to the overall deterrence posture and particularly the non-nuclear allies, which in, in most cases we're talking about, uh, will do so in, in a uh, conventional uh, in a conventional manner. I think that's one of the reasons why, for example, AUKUS is such an in 
important contribution to deterrence. It enhances in a very significant way uh, the capacity of Australia uh, to deal with the rising military and political threat represented by China. And by the way, this wouldn't have happened but for the fact that the Chinese have uh, engaged in a uh, an arms uh, buildup that is probably uh, unprecedented in history uh, and have engaged in aggressive uh, behavior all around their periphery, which they define as a pretty large part of, uh, uh, of the Asia Pacific. Um, uh, and so I, I do think uh, it's important uh, that uh, we consider how you enhance and bolster alliance capabilities by not just what the uh, security provider does, but the countries that are uh, recipient of that security provision, that is the allies. Uh, and as we stressed in the report uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, it is exceedingly important that all of the allies enhance their conventional capabilities in that way. Um, and, and that we have a, a serious discussion about what that really means. Um, uh, uh, Jessica mentioned the destabilizing possibility of long range conventional capabilities. I certainly don't think they're destabilizing in East Asia. Uh, I think they're uh, very much part and parcel of how to think about this, but only in an integrated fashion. And they have to be part of the overall strategy. Uh, and within that overall strategy, uh, how capabilities evolve is something that we ought to uh, spend a lot of time uh, working on. That The same uh, is the case, and, and uh, Gina mentioned this, with regard to missile defense. Um, missile defense are a contributor to deterrence uh, and extended deterrence. And indeed, you know, it's now official NATO policy that it's the combination of nuclear conventional and missile defense capabilities um, that provide for deterrence. Uh, the key is that all of that be done in concert uh, and not uh, haphazardly, that it be done uh, in coordination and consultation uh, with uh, allied partners. Uh, the, the East Asian situation is, is more complicated than the NATO situation because NATO has a process for doing that uh, and, and engages in that process. Um, the East Asian uh, situation is, is a, you know, we have a hub and spoke uh, alliance system in which the U.S. is the critical bilateral uh, security guarantor to countries like uh, uh, Japan, South Korea, Australia, uh, and, uh, and others, uh, Thailand, Ph Philippines, to some extent, Singapore. Uh, I, I think there is a, a need, uh, and I think there's a recognition that those um, countries spent more time thinking together about their own capabilities in concert with the United States. Um, uh, you know, big, uh, a big advocate of, of uh, restarting a trilateral security uh, process between Japan, uh, South Korea, and the United States, uh, uh, which I think is essential for extended deterrence and an essential for the credibility of, uh, uh, of deterrence in the region and essential for reassurance. And uh, going back to my, my first comment on this. So I think this is an integrated aspect that needs to be done in an integrated way. And the more we dis, uh, sort of distangle nuclear from uh, deterrence and reassurance overall, the more we're, we're, we create political problems that in the end, I don't think uh, uh, help as well. That said, nuclear weapons are different. Uh, and, and we should recognize that. I don't think anybody would, um, would deny that. Um, Tom Schelling, probably most famously in his address uh, receiving the, the Nobel Prize for Economics on the nuclear taboo, uh, has made uh, a, a living. Uh, uh, you know, is one of the great, the great strategists of all time uh, who has stressed that point. But even Tom uh, Schelling would agree that uh, there is a relationship between to conventional nuclear and I would argue missile defenses that needs to be part of, uh, of any process of thinking about it. Thank you. No, on that point, I, I would like to turn to, to Gina too, and this kind of obviously this concept of integrated deterrence, uh, right? And and Gina, I'm actually there was a really interesting press conference. Um, I don't maybe a couple of days ago, maybe yesterday, uh, at, at Pentagon press conference where the the the, the briefer was asked about you know. Can South Korea's new SLBM capability deter North Korean provocations? Um, and the, the reaction by the, the U.S. briefer was kind of like, "Well, I, you know, I, I would hope that the entire alliance can do that." Um, and then when pushed a little bit, uh, he kind of talked about the concept of integrated deterrence and how you know kind of opened up the doorway 
for this capability to fit within that construct and the way the United States is thinking about it. So I would be curious to get your take on the broader sort of question of the role of conventional capabilities and, and, and the, the right mix with nuclear capabilities. But also I think, um, you know, over the past you know, several months, South Korea has really moved out quite uh, quickly on between the SLBM development on sort of a range of, of uh, different missile capabilities with the revised missile guidelines being lifted. Um, how do those capabilities contribute to uh, sort of the, the broader um, deterrence architecture and the alliance? Because um, I can certainly see the way in which they could provide South Korea with an autonomous capability in some cases, but how are those capabilities being thought about or how should they be thought about in the broader alliance context? Okay. Um, uh, according to the same survey that I did, um, when asked about the importance and effectiveness of extended deterrence measures, South Korean experts uh, answered that in peacetime, conventional precision guided strike capabilities and missile defense would be important. But when it comes to questions about the effective options in a crisis, 80% of the South Korean respondents chose conventional precision guided strike capabilities, while 20% um, uh, chose non-kinetic left of launch capabilities. Um, South Korea's military buildup is a natural response to the advancement of North Korea's nuclear capabilities. This is an effort to prevent a widening gap between South Korea's ability to respond as the level of uh, North Korea threat changes so rapidly. The defense budget is increasing at an average annual rate of 7%, and the cost of improving defense capabilities has increased by 42% compared to uh, four years ago. This investment in force enhancement is focused on WMB response system. That's why the development of medium, uh, short range and medium range missiles and SLBM becomes so visible in these states. Um, also, South Korea wants to uh, have a military capabilities that matches its status as a middle power. So it wants to have as many options as possible to flexibly respond to changes in the regional and global context. And defense reform uh, 2.0 um, under the Moon Jae-in government uh, includes the development of state of the art science and technology that can help the military to be prepared to uh, security challenges in all directions. So the combination of internal and external factors prompt South Korea's uh, development of uh, military capabilities. Um, well, to me, it sounds like the US also has some trust issue. It seems that the issues of entrapment and abandonment come back again and again, and, and the ROG and the US have uh, combined actually a different system, and South Korea is responsible for responding to regional provocations. But the first thing that will start is communication between the, the ROG and the US at multiple levels. We have military committee, security consultative, uh, consultative meeting, integrated defense dialogue and, and many others for close coordination. So um, sometimes people argue that, well, South Korea is seeking some kind of autonomy, but uh, that's not the word that we use. We talk about interoperability and in increasing contribution as a powerful ally. So um, discussions in, in the security committee uh, community these days in Seoul centers around the value of South Korea as an alliance partner and a responsible member of the international community. So um, I think uh, you don't need to worry about uh, these kind of development for a while. That's uh, one thing that I would like to um, uh, emphasize. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Hideshi, uh, let's turn to you. I'd like to hear your perspective on, on sort of the right mix of conventional and nuclear capabilities. Um, let's see. Um, uh, for a long time, uh, China has engaged in rapid improvement uh, of its military power in quality and quantity, uh, focusing on nuclear, missile, uh, naval, and air forces, 
Uh, the naval force includes the China Coast Guard and uh, maritime militia force as instruments of gray zone warfare. Uh, China has attached importance to strengthening uh, its operational capabilities to gain uh, information superiorities as a means of both enhancing operational capabilities uh, throughout uh, the Chinese military and gaining asymmetrical uh, capabilities to prevent uh, enemies with overall military superiority from exerting their strength. Uh, specifically, China has been increasing, uh, increasingly emphasizing endeavors uh, to achieve dominance in new uh, domains. And encountering and deterring China, of course, uh, nuclear blackmail is not effective or credible uh, for all sorts of challenges uh, uh, from China. Uh, in the East Asian maritime space, conflicts with China may begin with China's uh, uh, gray zone tactics, as I have alluded to uh, previously, uh, to violate its uh, you know, uh, neighbors uh, national sovereignty in a way that does not amount to an armed attack. Uh, in order uh, for our side to gain uh, control of escalation, uh, the latter uh, should be, shouldn't be loose. Uh, it must be filled with a wide variety of means uh, in a seamless way. So uh, deployment of ground-based intermediate range missile is necessary to fill the gap with China and also capability to nullify, follow on uh, air, and the naval forces after China's first missile attacks are necessary to prevent uh, China from taking control of the air and uh, sea, uh, in, uh, particularly in the vicinity of Japan. Thank you. Um, Jessica, over to you for final comments and remarks on this. And then we, we have just a couple of minutes to go to the audience for questions, which we'll do next. Sure, well, I think um, I would subscribe to a lot of what uh, Eva said already um, about, you know, kind of how we think about the role of conventional capabilities in NATO. Uh, we do have what we call our appropriate mix of conventional and nuclear and missile defense capabilities, which is what comprises our, our deterrence and defense. Um, as the Secretary General has, has outlined um, repeatedly over the last few years, we are looking at a much more integrated and holistic approach between looking at um, our response to Russia's growing um, regional missile threat, looking at how we address um, the growing threat from Russia across all three of these baskets. So including you know, things like strengthening our nuclear survivability and resilience to the Russian missile challenge, um, but and strengthening our um, integrated air and missile defense, our theater range missile defense systems, but also looking, looking at what offensive strike capabilities that we need um, to enhance our, our deterrence uh, from, a, from a regional perspective. So, so this is something that we're very actively working on right now. Um, you know, there's a number of different lines of effort that are looking at this, including in the planning domain, um, looking at enhancing our exercises so that we understand the regional dynamics. Um, and the kind of escalation across the conventional nuclear spectrum. Um, and then looking, of course, at what capabilities we actually need to develop and put into our kind of long-term capability planning. So a lot of that work is, is ongoing um, at, as we speak at NATO. Um, and I would just say, you know, I think it's not just about how conventional capabilities um, enhance conventional deterrence, but it's also how conventional capabilities integrate with nuclear capabilities to, to provide uh, deterrent um, capabilities across the spectrum. Um, for instance, we know that um, you know, Russian A2AD uh, would be quite, it's quite effective and quite robust. And you need, in order to be able to undertake any kind of nuclear operations, particularly DCA aircraft, uh, DCA operations, you would need capabilities to be able to degrade Russian A2AD. So this is you know, the type of role that you would expect conventional 
uh, missiles to, to undertake to, to attract and degrade um, uh, Russia's A2AD in, in a conflict scenario. So, so there's a lot of ways that these things overlap and intersect too. It's not just about deterrence at every phase of conflict, it's also about how they work together to create, a, you know, to use the American phrase, an, an integrated deterrence picture. Thank you, Jessica. Um, let's take a couple of questions from the, uh, the virtual audience. We have one from Heather Williams. This is uh, for Evil Dollar, but perhaps others want to weigh in as well. Uh, the question is, what would it mean if a NATO member joined the TPNW, the nuclear ban, right? Um, how, and how do you think NATO should respond to the TPNW? Is the rhetoric too strong or not strong enough? So for... Um... A NATO member to uh, join uh, the agreement would basically mean that the, that uh, it would reject at that point the, the very deterrent strategy to which it has signed up, which is why none of them have, in fact, to date uh, uh, and are likely to, as long as they're members of the alliance, sign up to it. Um, and I, uh, you know, I think the rhetoric that comes from NATO is perfectly appropriate. Uh, NATO has made clear that so long as nuclear weapons exist, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. Um, and uh, while uh, the day in which all nuclear weapons are uh, no longer uh, no longer exist uh, may be may be far or near, uh, probably more far than near, uh, NATO uh, as an as an organization and the countries that are members of it um, will abide by. I think this very true statement that as long as nuclear weapons exist, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. And I think that's that's how it looks at, uh, and the individual countries look at, uh, at the issue. And I don't think that's going to change. Thank you. Jessica, do you want to weigh in on that one at all? Um, no, I would just say that I obviously think our, our rhetoric is, is quite good on the TPNW and certainly, uh, certainly not insufficient. Um, but I do think it just to, to add to Evo's point, I mean, I think the, the obligations of being a member of NATO uh, today and the obligations associated with the TPNW and becoming a state party to that treaty are fundamentally inconsistent. And so um, should a NATO ally choose to join the, the TPNW, I think that, you know, that would that would put one of their treaty, you know, treaty obligations at question. And so that would certainly be a, a significant um, issue for, for NATO and, and for the Alliance um, more broadly. Um, and I would just say, you know, I think there's, uh, well, I would say I, I see a lot of the, you know, nuclear disarmament chattering classes talk about, um, you know, kind of the NATO rhetoric and, and isn't it too strong and things like that. Um, but I would also say that, um, you know, or why, you know, why is it, you know, reaching out to the TBNW uh, to try to build bridges and things like this? And, you know, I would just say that um, bridge building goes, goes both ways. And I think the rhetoric and the coming out of a lot of the ban treaty movement, um, if not the actual states parties to the ban treaty, has been quite negative um, and, and against NATO um, and against our position. And so I think that, um, you know, uh, our position is clear and we try to state it clearly and rationally for legal reasons, uh, if nothing else. Um, but I would say that, uh, you know, as we go into the MPT and then the, the TPNW States Parties Conference, uh, I think NATO will remain pretty strongly aligned with where it is. Um, and we, I don't think we're going to see any fundamental shifts in, uh, in our rhetoric or, or allies' you know, actions. No, thank you, Jessica. Uh, so I think we've got time for one more. Um, I'll take this one. This is from um, Richard LaRiviere. Hopefully I pronounced that name correctly. Is the concept of the nuclear posture review obsolete? Um, and should it migrate to some other form, a strategic posture review, and include space and cyber capabilities? And I, I would be curious in, you know, you can answer that from your own perspective, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, how U.S. allies would react to the NPR going away entirely or being subsumed in, in some other uh, document. In other who, words, who what you, importance do they attach to that process, I guess? Who, who would you like to answer? You want me to uh, go first? This is kind of just first. jump ball. 
So uh, here's jump ball. I'll grab it uh, just for a minute. I, I, I do think that we have to stress the importance that nuclear weapons are different. They're fundamentally different than any other weapon. They've used, been used twice. We've seen uh, in, 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 as in the 70 plus years that they haven't existed. Um, there is, I strongly believe in that nuclear taboo uh, that affects policymakers um, throughout those who have nuclear weapons and those who don't, those who rely on them and those who don't. Um, and uh, I don't think you can mix and match the nuclear uh, as easily with other weapons. Uh, uh, so I would not uh, abandon uh, a detailed look by each administration on the role of nuclear weapons, how to think about them, what the policy process should be, uh, about whether that's the NPR or some other process doesn't really matter. I don't. I mean, we didn't have an NPR uh, in uh, in the Clinton administration, but there's a lot of thinking about uh, nuclear weapons at that time when we didn't have an, an NPR uh, in the uh, during the Cold War. But there was a, a, a lot of thinking in in Defense Department documents, uh, etc. Um, that was there. What I would like to see is the NPR taken away from just the Defense Department because I do not think nuclear weapons, sort of by their nature, is just a Defense Department issue. It is a administration wide issue. Uh, and the fact that it's in the NDAA means uh, it, it naturally lands there. Uh, and I don't think that's where it belongs, um, because I think there are uh, multiple uh, avenues uh, that need to be decide, uh, discussed within an administration when it comes to nuclear weapons. And the president is the ultimate decision maker, not just as commander in chief, but as president of the United States and the only elected person in the executive branch uh, by, the, uh, by the American people. Uh, has a, a special responsibility, as, as we're, we're learning every day, uh, given what's happened, uh, what's coming out about the last days in the, in the previous administration. So I do think we need a something like the NPR um, uh, and, and not uh, try to uh, say it's all the same as every other weapon because it, uh, it undermines the uniqueness of nuclear weapons, their uniqueness in the deterrence uh, perspective, even uniqueness in the reassurance perspective, and their uniqueness as the most destructive weapons that uh, uh, humankind has, uh, has created. Thank you. Others, anyone else want to weigh in on that? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, uh, we will leave it there because um, we're, we're at time. I just want to say thank you to uh, Ambassador Dalder, um, uh, Jessica Cox, Dr. Gina Kim, and Hideshi Tokuchi. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this panel for a fascinating discussion, for sharing your insights. For many of you, you know, getting up very early or staying up very late, uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, so, so thank you. Um, and then I just want to say thank you again to Senator King for joining us for the, the keynote earlier today. Thank you, of course, to North of Grumman for their support for this conference. Uh, please join us tomorrow at 9 a.m. Where, we, where we're going to pick this up for day two. The first panel is going to discuss the future of arms control in the context of nuclear modernization and deterrence requirements. And then we're going to have following that kind of a concluding panel uh, where we, we sort of ask folks to integrate a lot of these ideas that we've heard throughout the conference and some of these themes and kind of offer up their own thoughts on how this administration should balance, you know, this, this nuclear trilemma and these differing or, or sometimes competing uh, policy goals. So with that, we will leave it there. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day or your evening. Thank you very much. Goodbye. See you again. <laughs>